listening to Sinister Spotlight here on Mephisto's Castle. As you know, I am Jose, and for today's episode, I am extremely pleased and honored to have one half of the dynamic duo from Mad 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 Movies. Did I miss a mad there? I think you I did. You a I did. I ha you, you have to have all four mads to really get the point across. So let me rectify that right now. It's Mad 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 movies and I'm here it's with that fourth mad that makes all the difference it does it makes a world of difference a mad world of difference <laughs> but I'm here with none other than the vicar of VHS uh, basically what more can I say than it's a fantastic blog it is so much fun and all the reviews are simply hilarious and basically you're just hurting yourself if you haven't read anything from them so Vicar I'm so pleased to have you here and thanks for joining us tonight well I am uh, happy to be here and uh, you know it's always it's always great to talk to others who uh, have pledged their souls to the faith of mad 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 movies you know and uh, the Duke sends his regrets he couldn't be here he's in you know Bulgaria somewhere yeah. doing God knows what so uh, well but, I'm sure we'll hear all about it spirit, yeah. <laughs> well just that's that's what counts as long as we have the Duke and spirit then I think tonight's episode will be a success for sure <laughs> did I say spirit I meant spirits oh spirits <laughs> well in, now, he's, now. In, he's in his spirits oh well we're, we're talking about something completely different altogether well in that right. case I send the Duke my regards and I'm sure all two people who are listening do as well <laughs> So, for those of you interested in knowing, today, for this episode of Sinister Spotlight, we will be talking about The Unknown from 1927 starring Lon Chaney Sr., which is the Vickers pick, and it is a very bizarre, deservedly so, film that was a lot of fun to watch, and I'm looking forward to getting uh, getting into the nitty-gritty of this uh, this silent classic with you. All right, yeah, that's uh, it's it's one that a lot of people haven't heard of, and even fewer have seen, and uh, I think that's uh, that's a shame, really, because it's yeah. it's ripe for rediscovery. I think so too. It's uh, like you say, you know, not too many people have well, just in discussions of Lon Chaney June, uh, Lon Chaney Senior, excuse me. Um, usually you just hear of Phantom of the Opera and Hunchback of Notre Dame. Sometimes you'll even hear the penalty before you hear of the unknown, which, like you say, is a real shame because, if anything, this is the film, especially with Todd Browning at helm, that really, you know, it, it just sings. The, the you know, the Browning-Cheney collaboration, it, it's it's at its best here, I think, out of all their film I, collaborations. I, I agree, you know, and, and that's why I picked the movie, because, you know, Todd Browning is such a, a well-known figure in the, in the horror history as the director of uh, of Dracula and then a, then later of Freaks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Lon Chaney Sr., of course, with the, uh, you know, sort of the grandfather not only of horror, but of, uh, I would argue, modern acting. Yes. And, uh, and he's, uh, you know, so to have those guys together, they made several films together, and I think none quite as bizarre and off-kilter as this one. Exactly, and it says it right in the title, so... To really start detailing some of the oddities that occur in this film, would you mind giving us kind of a rundown of the film's plot and see what's going on here? I would be orgasmically delighted. Oh my god, that just <laughs> blew my pants off. I can't wait to hear what you have to say now. <laughs> All right. Well, The, uh, the Unknown is, uh, tells the story of a uh, poor circus performer, Gypsy, named Alonzo, and he is uh, known professionally as Alonzo the Armless. Um, as you might gather, he has no arms. Oh. So he, uh, he does a circus act where with his toes and, uh, and legs, he throws knives, he uh, does some sharpshooting um, with the assistance of his uh, lovely assistant played by a, an extremely young Joan Crawford. Unsurprisingly, because Joan Crawford in this movie is distractingly hot <laughs> at 18 years old, um, he is madly, hopelessly in love with the girl, um, which is lucky for him because, as it happens, she has a very bizarre phobia of men and their hands. 
Um, she has grown up in a circus. She's met a lot of rough types. Uh, people have always been putting their hands all over her, and she's sick of it. And she's she's got this morbid phobia of hands and arms. Therefore, uh, Alonzo seems the perfect fit, having no arms himself. Um, also in this little uh, um, love triangle is the circus strongman, Malabar, who is your typical... Um, you know, bland movie <laughs> hero type who uh, does all the wrong things to try to get uh, Joan Crawford's character to love him, mainly, you know, grabbing her hand, wrapping <laughs> his arms around her, things that just horrify her. And uh, he is egged on in this a little bit by Alonzo. However, Alonzo has a very dark secret. And uh, I assume that spoilers are going to be the... Uh, the rule of the day here, so I'll just yeah. leap right in. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, yeah, Alonzo actually has arms. He uh, he is a fugitive criminal on the run from the law, and in order to hide from them, he's happened upon this idea of strapping his arms behind him with this very torturous uh, corset leather type thing um, to make him appear to have no arms, and he is also extremely dexterous with his feet, obviously, so he's able to uh, pull this off. Um, it gets weirder, because not only is he uh, armed, so to speak, <laughs> but he also has a strange deformity on one of his hands, a double thumb. So yes, he has three thumbs, much like the Duke and me, <laughs> and... Um, and is a famous criminal for that. The police are looking for a strangler with three thumbs because, you know, it leaves a very distinctive mark on his, on his victim's throat. So the story of the movie is about Alonzo um, hiding his true nature and also trying to um, consummate his love for this, uh, for this young lady. Um, and he goes to some very extreme sacrifices for her, uh, it doesn't always work out that well, and uh, leads to a suitably, you know, uh, energetic climax. You wrap that up in a warped little bow quite nicely, I must say. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, like you say, a lot of the plot elements at work here really kind of fit the formula of uh, melodrama, basically, because you have that love triangle in the center, and for all intents and purposes, you, you know, the parts of that triangle are the hero, the damsel in distress, sorry for the uh, non-PC term there, and the villain. You know, it, it's interesting because, you know, a, a lot of horror movies, a lot of people don't seem to realize, are basically melodramas at their core, I think, anyway. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's a very old, uh, it's a very old format, and it's one of the, you know, somebody... Uh, famously said that there are only like what three or four stories yeah, exactly. period <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and this would be uh, this would be one of them um, but it's never quite as simple as that with uh, with Cheney I think because uh, while he is in the villain corner of that triangle he's not um, he doesn't allow you to simply hate him I mean you know right. to, to talk about someone who's one of your favorites um, Todd Slaughter, you know, when, when Todd Slaughter is the villain, he's the villain, you know, there, oh, yeah. there's nothing besides that. <laughs> yeah, no, he doesn't you let you forget it. <laughs> you don't have to wonder, you know. Um, but with Cheney, he, he's always a little bit uh, more subtle. He's There's always a pathos to his character, and, uh, and he doesn't let you just completely hate him. And here, I think that manifests itself in the fact that he, his love for the girl is actually quite pure. Yes, um, exactly. He's not trying to rape her. He's not trying to attack her. He's not. Uh, he doesn't want anything but the best for her, and he is willing to do anything for her love. And it, and it's really quite affecting. It is. It really is. And you know, you bring up a, a fantastic point. Usually with, uh, you know, darker characters that assume the role of a villain, even if, even when we, we get that chance to sympathize with them, usually their motives still are not the best, <laughs> or, or their, their intentions aren't the best for everybody involved. But here, you know, Alonzo's motivation to do what he does is 
so, like you say, pure that we can't help but really want to root for this guy. And in a lot of ways, it, you know, it reflects uh, one of Cheney's other most famous characters, uh, you know, Eric the Phantom of the Opera, who pretty much just loved this woman so much that he went to <laughs> beyond any reasonable measure to, to prove his devotion to her. Right. And, and I think that uh, especially, you know, for... Uh, I mean, I can't speak for all horror nerds, but certainly for a majority of horror nerds that I know, um, it's something that you can really relate to. I mean, every, everybody that I know had that, you know, person that they were completely obsessed with in junior high school, usually, or sometimes high school, and were willing to go through any humiliations, and keep coming back for more just because to prove, you know, that, that they were sincere in all that they did. Um, and if uh, it's it's just lucky they didn't have access to high explosives, you know, because uh, like uh, like Eric did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And he just you know happened to have this really cool underground lair, and right. you know Eric. Who doesn't want those, really? What was that? Who doesn't want one of those? Well, God, I don't know. You have to be a complete loser not to want an underground lair, especially with a, you know, what was it, a scorpion and a grasshopper explosive trigger? I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and a pipe. Don't forget nope. that. Yeah, the pipe, the, the reed that, you know, he was able to swim around in. That's right. But, you know, you you bring up a, a, a an interesting point, you know, because what are really Alonzo and Eric and, you know, even Quasimodo, who, again, same type of character with similar motivations, you know, what are they really other than like the underdog, you know, in, in Eric's case, literally he's the underdog. He lives underground. Right. <laughs> he, um, you know, they're basically the nerds, you know, they're, they're the outcasts <laughs> that I know it's kind of funny to think of a, like a, <laughs> a oh, that's brilliant. I love that. yeah, well, you know, just imagine Eric and Glee club and you, it's perfect image right there. <laughs> They need to do the uh, the Phantom of the Opera Glee, Glee yeah, exactly with, with Cheney's likeness. I want them to do it with that one. Well, it would have to be the uh, the, the skinny uh, gay kid. Yeah, exactly. The, the opera kind of thing. I don't know the characters' names. I know that uh, uh, Emily from Deadly Dolls House would uh, would string me up on my toes for not knowing <laughs> the, the Glee stuff. But it's okay. You're safe here. We're we're uh, not a very Glee friendly place here. So you're in the safe <laughs> house. You're in the safe house. So, but, uh, right. no, but seriously though, it, it's, you know, these characters, Alonzo and Eric and Quasi, you know, they're kind of like the high school nerds who always get picked on and ridiculed for either the way they look or what they lack, you know, physically or figuratively. And it's, you know, the, the, the movies, you know, the adventures that they participate in, so to speak, kind of serve as their way of getting back at everybody. Like when, um, yeah, and Malabar, what is he but the uh, football-playing jock? Exactly, know? exactly. Him and his grand mustache. God <laughs> yeah, damn, that guy. That is a pretty awesome mustache, so it has <laughs> I to know. be said. That's probably what Alonzo was really upset about, just the fact that he didn't have the mustache. Forget the arms, you know. that. <laughs> but but no, seriously, yeah, that, you know, it's, it's like these, you know, these... Uh, dweebs, <laughs> so to speak, are finally getting back at the people who've, you know, ridiculed them for all their life, you know, whether they did it blatantly or not. So, like you say, getting to the point, uh, it's, it's, I think it's very easy just for, you know, horror fans in general, and again, don't mean to speak for everybody, but I, I think it is easy, just maybe not even for just horror fans, but for people in general to kind of sympathize with that person, the you know the outcast and the person who was picked on, we all kind of want to cheer for that person, and particularly in this film, the unknown. I mean, it's just heartbreaking what happens to him. You know the yeah, the lengths that he goes to. It's it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's with Cheney especially though. Um, it doesn't work unless you've got a very strong performance, and uh, I've seen a lot of Cheney's uh, surviving films. And I really believe that this is one of his uh, crowning performances. It is, um, it really is. It's, I think one of the reasons it's not as well known is because he's not, you know, covered in makeup in this one. It's not this yeah. iconic, you know, uh, image of, a, of the monster or of the villain. 
he has no makeup at all. He only, he wears the corset to keep his arms back and that's it. Um, and yet his performance in this is so moving and so modern, um, in a way that I'd like to talk about a little bit. Um, sure. it's, it's just, it's astounding. me. The first time I saw this movie, it just blew me away. And I thought this is, is, is what shows Cheney was because, uh, getting back to my earlier point, it's, um, with the silent film, there's a lot of uh, modern viewers who don't like to go back and, uh, and talk about this film or see old silent films because they, uh, I think they're frightened. That they don't, uh, they don't really know how to watch it, and that's understandable because the um, the language of a silent film is a completely different cinematic language than we've got now. You've got these amazingly stylized arm motions, these huge expressions, wide eyes, you know, circled with, uh, with eyeliner. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a completely different method of acting. It's a completely different engagement with the audience than we have today. And it's hard to jump back in time to that. Um, I, I like to make the uh, comparison between this and no theater, Japanese no theater, um, being so stylized and requiring a certain amount of knowledge on the part of the audience and a certain willingness to enter into that conversation in that different language. So, uh, and in this, see that a lot. I mean, Joan Crawford, who would later become an icon in her own right, of course, with uh, Trog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of well, course, the Joan, the Joan said, Crawford classic that, I mean, who could well, forget it? He said in Trog. <laughs> but, um, and then you've got all these, I'm sure, accomplished silent film actors who were doing the silent film acting. But when Cheney is on the screen, and he's doing it too, he's speaking the same language, but he, there's just something about his performance that for me is much more modern. Um, I don't want to say method acting, really, but you really see the emotion in his uh, performance in a way that you don't see them in these other actors performances. Uh, the other actors are, you know, kind of turned up to 11 <laughs> and he almost tells it back a little bit. Um, and there are some amazing scenes in this uh, movie where Cheney just brings the emotion out so strongly that it seems like a, uh, like a modern performance to me. No, I totally agree with you. It's, you know, it, it was really astounding to see Cheney just perform in, in this movie. And, you know, I, I don't use the word facetiously. It really is something you, you just got to stop and really take in. Because like you say, there are just certain nuances in his performance that, you know, which is a benefit for people who are more used to seeing contemporary cinema. It, it's, you know, a benefit for them watching a Cheney movie because there's, you know, little modern flourishes in the things he does that, maybe, uh, you know, a contemporary audience can connect with a lot more. Well, you can, I mean, you can really see uh, what Cheney was. I mean, how far ahead of everybody he was. I exactly. mean, he was just, uh, I mean, like I say, the other actors, I'm sure, were just, you know, were fine or, or too very good, you know, at the, at the silent film. But just with Cheney in there, he's just so far beyond everybody else that it's really... And I think that for someone who hasn't seen a lot of silent movies, if you watch this one, this one is kind of... Um, uh, it, I, don't know, I don't know how accessible it is, but it, it, it it's, gives you that kind of bridge between the silent acting style and the, uh, and the more modern style. But it's, a, but it's certainly not a, a realistic movie. We don't want oh, no. to give that... <laughs> impression <laughs> no it certainly isn't i mean especially you know with some of the events occurring the way they do it's just you know like we mentioned before it's just a very highly romanticized melodrama so the way people as as uh you know realistic 
so to speak, as their acting might be, the events in which they occur and aren't the most true to life. Well, so. I mean, just running back down over the synopsis, you know, you've got a armless guy <laughs> who throws knives with his feet, well, except that he isn't armless. And happens and to have three thumbs. <laughs> Yeah. And then, you know, he's in love with a girl who just so happens to have this morbid fear of hands. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's 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 just a crazy idea, you know. And, uh, <laughs> he actually ends up uh, murdering the girl's father. Yeah, uh, I just remembered the girl's name, actually. It's Nanon. Nanon, her, that's right. That's... Yeah. Um, is uh, he actually ends up murdering her father, not because he's, you know, evil, although he certainly is, but because right. the father wants to keep him away from uh, from Nanon. And, uh, you know, he can't have that, you know. You can't. Oh, of course not, yeah. And, <laughs> so, you know, three... I have she to... sees him, but she doesn't see his face. She yeah. only sees his thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's, it's like, okay, uh, let me get this straight. You didn't see the killer's face, but you were able to note from the distance you were at that he had an extra thumb coming off his finger. Yeah, she could pick those thumbs out of a lineup. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, do these thumbs look familiar to you, ma'am? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell that's his thumbprint because there's two of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, no, uh, so, yeah, that um, this was another point that uh, I, I couldn't help but noting. We, we've kind of made allusions to it just now, is that uh, as, you know, as uh, tragic as, as the movie may be and as really uh, moving as it can be at times, it can also be almost deliriously wacky and it can definitely have almost. its mad moments <laughs> <laughs> but you know one of those moments uh like that just struck me as being it, it was kind of played for laughs because one of the characters reacted by laughing but i don't think it was strictly played for comedy but it was just so ridiculous that you can't help but smile at it it's uh the moment i believe that's right before Alonzo decides to go through with the amputation, and he's very upset, and he's in the room with his little somewhat midget henchman, and... He's dwarfish. His, yeah, definitely. his dwarfish he's a henchman. Dwarfish sort yeah. of person. Yeah. His slightly hobbit-esque henchman, and he's very emotional, and at one point he sits down, and he's starting to cry, so him being Alonzo the Armless, he naturally takes his big toe and his little toe and wipes away his tears with them and it's just kind of a wacky thing to see and you can't yeah, help you it can't, you can't really watch that and be uh and and be you know just heart wrenched by that you know, yeah watching somebody blow his nose on his toes you know? exactly I, it, I i think a scene like that would have really worked and you know say something like titanic if we just saw maybe leonardo dicaprio wipe away his tears with his feet you know would have really yeah. you know done something to get us emotionally invested in in the movie but, now, uh, there's something that we should bring up here as well is that um you know cheney was well known for uh for just really really getting into his roles um yeah. putting himself through all kinds of physical tortures in order to get the look of his character right um there are countless examples of that kind of thing from the penalty to the phantom of the opera to right. you know any of any number of these um but in this one, and I believe in the, uh, I've got this book by uh, David J. Skull, who's one of my favorite uh, favorite film yeah. authors, uh, called Dark Carnival, The uh, Secret World of Todd Browning, Hollywood's Master of the Macabre. And uh, it talks about um, the film there, and it says in, in the book that this was the first time that Cheney actually had to use a body double. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, it is not, and I think maybe even the trade papers at the time kind of played up that Cheney had actually learned to do all these things with his feet, but it's not true. Right, yeah. <laughs> he, uh, he actually had an actual, um, an actually armless performer from a circus uh, playing the lower half of his body in these scenes where uh, he's throwing the knives, doing the sharpshooting, uh, playing a guitar at one point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, which that made me laugh. Because, <laughs> you know, Jeff Buckley's got nothing on this guy. Exactly, he plays um, with the stoves. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, lighting a cigarette and wiping his tears, doing all these things. Um, it was actually just Cheney sitting on the chest of this, you know, this person, uh, and that person doing all these things for him. So uh, so that's uh, that's a lot of fun there. But um, 
we haven't really talked very much about uh, about some of the things that might shock a uh, a modern viewer coming to a silent film like this because uh, there are some things in this that are just really wacky oh, yeah. that we talked about, but there's also some things that are kind of you know surprisingly um, uh, you know unwholesome, let's <laughs> say. Exactly, you know, we have when people. Uh you know, usually think of silent films, you know, they usually think, oh, like Charlie Chaplin. Well, you have yeah. that, but you also have the unknown, which yeah. exactly isn't exactly Charlie Chaplin. I think uh, probably the one scene in particular that you're probably alluding to here is uh, when Alonzo's doing his circus act and he's throwing the knives at uh, Nanon, and in essence, not only is he throwing these knives and demonstrating his wonderful marksmanship that he has with his feet, but he's also stripping her yes, <laughs> of her clothes. Yeah, he, is, he is so accurate that he can hit the uh, the buttons of this outfit that she's wearing such that it falls from her body as he's uh, as he's uh, throwing the knives. And it's a very, uh, I mean, it's a, I, she shows a lot of skin, not only yeah. there and uh, not only there, but in later scenes, she's walking around, uh, in a sort of, you know, proto bikini, you know, the gypsy, uh, halter top and, uh, and pants. And, uh, and as I say, Joan Crawford in this movie, she's 18 years old and she is amazingly gorgeous she is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with these huge eyes and this wonderful figure and, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a very sexy scene, a lot sexier than a lot of people are uh, <laughs> usually think about for this type of movie. Or Joan although, Crawford. <laughs> although the pre-code movies, you know, there's all kinds of examples where they push that uh, as far as they felt they reasonably could. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, uh, no, yeah, the, you know, there are, you know, and, and then that's one of the things that, kind of, well, <laughs> attracts me to the movie. Not so much that, oh, we get to see Joan Crawford, you know, bear a lot of naked flesh, but, you know, the unknown, which Browning's movies tend to do a lot of the times, it really seems to, as far as it can, really kind of explore taboo land, so to speak, because you have you know, the circus life, which especially even at that time was, you know, pretty much looked down upon. Yeah, and certainly. yeah, you, you know, you just have all these goings on behind it. Like, you know, people are being killed. Criminals are, you know, actually hiding under, you know, uh, false, you know, false identities and, um, Deformed people. yeah, yeah. And it's um, just a very seedy of, uh, place. I mean, famously, you know, we haven't talked about Browning that much, but uh, anybody who's, who knows much about Browning knows that he was uh, obsessed with this kind of underworld um, of uh, these lower, uh, lower levels of society, these outsiders, these outcasts. Right. Um, uh, much of the, many of them uh, in the circus, you know, in some way that he's, his movies are full of dwarfs and uh, deformed people and uh transvestites and, yeah. and just everything that uh, all these taboo, you know, kind of outcast um, members of society, he, that's what really fascinated him. And, and they show up again and again in his, uh, in his movies, most famously, of course, in Freaks. Right. Which, uh, you know, he, he was on top of the world after making Dracula, one of the most successful movies of the, of the early 30s. Um, the studio told him, you know, you can do whatever you want now. And what he decided to do was something that almost ruined his career <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because he brought out the, uh, the real, uh, circus, uh, oddities, the real performers, um, put them on screen, which at that time people found very distasteful, but not only just the fact of seeing them, but what they did, you know, the, uh, the, Midget marrying a full-grown woman. Yeah. The uh, the mutilation of that woman later yeah. on, you know, which is still a really, really shocking. You know, you talk right. about uh, people going to the unknown and being shocked at how you know uh, dark it is. You know, you watch Freaks, and that is probably not what people think of when they think, oh, thirty cinema at all. You know, it right. is some really heavy stuff, especially, you know, the well, mutilation. It's, well, it's that kind of stuff that, you know, brought about the, the Hays Code. Yeah, exactly. Um, that later, you know, forced everything into this kind of, you know, apple pie, white bread kind of, <laughs> kind of mold. 
but I mean themes themes like that themes of the outcasts of of deformity of mutilation. Um, you t- we talked about the mutilation of the woman in Freaks, um, and you kind of uh, spoiled this a little bit earlier. But um, <laughs> but uh, w- the thing that uh, that Alonzo does in this movie to prove his love for Nanon, um, she's got this fear of arms and hands. She, he knows that if she ever finds out he actually has hands, he'll be uh, she'll be just as afraid of him as she is of all other men. So uh, he takes the rather extreme step of going to a surgeon that he knows and has some dirt on and can blackmail and uh, forces the surgeon to actually amputate his arms so that he becomes actually armless. And it's during this time that because, you know, at the scene we were talking about earlier when he uh, when he wipes his nose with the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, with his feet, uh, the his dwarf companion, whose name is Kojo. Yeah, that's right. Uh, always remember the names of the dwarfs. They'll, <laughs> they'll pay you back. Um, the uh, Kojo uh, starts laughing and says, uh, look, you know, you're not even wearing the corset and you, you forgot you've got arms, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're just doing everything with your feet anyway. And, uh, and that's when he gets the idea, you know, well, hey, I don't really need my arms, you know, and I can get rid of them and, uh, and still uh, and get this that I want more than anything in the world. So he goes, he has the surgery. It takes weeks to recover, obviously, because, you know, you're losing quite a lot of flesh there. Yeah. And it's during that time that Nanon overco- miraculously overcomes her <laughs> phobia and falls in love with Malabar. Um, and that is what sets up the uh, the third act of the film, where um, where Cheney returns. Uh, he's ready to declare his love for Nanon um, and say, you know, we can be together. You know, you never have to be with these people with hands ever again. <laughs> and uh, and that's when he comes back and discovers that everything he has just sacrificed has been for nothing. And it is just a punch in the gut. Yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, and, and if you stop to think about it, it's such a ridiculous situation, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, but it's a testament to Cheney and also to uh, Browning's direction that one, you don't have time to kind of sit back and think about it, and two, <laughs> that uh, that he's got you so interested in the plight of this character that uh, that you don't, you know, you don't care. You say, yeah, sure, of course, he would cut his arms off in order to, uh, you know, get a date with this girl. <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. I mean, it, and, it basically... And that, and that is, not only is that something that's reasonable, it's something that is laudable, you know. It's something that he's, uh, it shows that he is really, you know, the guy that she should pick, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. gonna, Who would do that for you, you know, I mean... Only the most devoted, and we, we it's, you know, especially with this movie, we almost kind of accept like you say, the fact that these events happen the way they do and we're not going to question it. It's a, it's a very, um, you know, the story is very reminiscent of like an EC comic story. I mean, only irony of that nature would happen to a character, you know, from those comics where it's like they are the butt of some awful cosmic joke and, and we it just is. accept it. it. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> well, and, and going back to what you said earlier uh, about the, uh, about, you know, the, the nerds, the horror <laughs> guys being the nerds of cinema, you know, I mean, this is something that you could imagine happening to you, you know, when you're in junior, or I certainly could to me when I was in uh, junior high school, you know, it was like, you know, I would go to all this trouble, you know, I would get my, uh, you know, as she said that uh, red roses were her favorite flower, <laughs> so I get, you know, two dozen roses and I come to them with my arm, arms full of roses to school only to discover that she's changed her mind and now she likes, you know, monster trucks or something <laughs> exactly at least and here you... i am standing there with arms full of roses everybody's laughing at me you know? but at <laughs> least you still have arms to, yeah. I was, i've spent all the money i've saved for you know two years on this and it's just <laughs> for nothing you know <laughs> so. but at least you still have arms to be full of roses that's true. So it's even worse for Alonzo. Yeah. But uh, I mean, we're having some fun with it. But it's it's actually that moment that is the uh, the the moment of the movie for me. Yeah. Because uh, there's just this shot of Alonzo sort of absorbing what he's just learned as Nanon comes out and says, "Oh, 
uh, and it, and it's so cruel too the way that it's filmed. Yeah. Because he's there and he, she says, "Oh, you know, I'm so I'm so happy to see you." You know, and he said, "Well, you know, I'm happy to see you too." Um, and she says, "Great, it's wonderful that you're back. Now we can be married." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's such a so and, uh, so rude. You know, he gets this, his face lights up, and you know he can't <laughs> believe that it's it's happening exactly the way that he imagined. You know, and then she says, "I'll go get him," <laughs> and that's when his face just crumbles, and uh, he starts really go over the edge into madness. But but there's a uh, there's a long scene where they're just sitting there talking about how happy they are, how they're in love, they're going to be married. And uh, the camera just focuses on Cheney and on his face, and he starts laughing. Yeah. This uh, this mad laughter, and of course, at first the the lovers think, "Oh, he's happy for us," but it just kind of holds on him, and he's and he and the laughter continues, and it gets more and more frenetic, more and more manic. Tears spring to his eyes, and the the laughter turns to to tears and and to you know howls of. <laughs> pain and i swear to god the first time i saw that i could almost hear him i mean i could literally almost hear the noise that he was making yeah <laughs> because that was how just enraptured by the performance i was and um it's you know it's kind of a cliche to say oh you know cheney this is a great you know actor and everything but this really you know proves it if you if you needed proof no, um, no, yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, you know, like you, this was my first time seeing the movie, and right when it got to that scene, it, like you say, it just punches you in the gut because the very first shot you see of Cheney right after uh, Nanon has brought Malabar out, the, like the very first shot you see of him, it's just his face and it's like frozen, and you can just see the glint of a few tears start to well up in his eyes and you're basically speechless. Like you can really feel for this guy. I mean, your heart goes out to him and, you know, Cheney just being as involved and completely convinced that he is Alonzo and this is the pain he's feeling. It just draws you in and he holds, you know, that's if, if any part of, this particular movie had to be lauded for, you know, just grabbing the audience attention and, you know, just keeping it, you know, it would, it would be this scene just because he, like you say, you know, his acting is so good that it almost transcends the silent medium that he's working in. I mean, you know, it sounds funny, but I, I really, I really believe that. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a good, you know, it, it's a perfect way of saying it because you, he's just so in the moment that you feel like you really could hear those howls of pain that, you know, are coming from his mouth. And it's just, you know, if, if the movie had, had to be recommended for any one thing, I mean, just watch that scene and you'll, you know, come on. I, I, th I think the majority of people will, will choke up a little bit, <laughs> just oh, a little certainly. bit. Yeah. Not only the, acting of Cheney in that film, I think you got to give a little credit to, uh, to Browning as, as a director there for the way that he puts that together, the way that he cuts between, uh, Cheney and the lovers and back again, um, really kind of builds, really twists the knife. I mean, he knew how to wring that out of the scene, you know? Yeah. I mean, he had, you know, the ace of all aces in Cheney, but then he also was, was using the visual, um, medium to uh, to do that, which you know, we talk. It's it's a cliche that there's nothing new under the sun. You know, everything's been done. It's everything that's going to be done has been done mo more or less. But really, at this time, this early in in cinema, um, I mean, it'd been going for you know twenty thirty years from the first you know from the earliest uh, films, but um, but still, you know, they were still just figuring everything out. They were, uh, everything was, uh, they didn't have any models you know, to, yeah. to work on. You know, everything was just, we've got to figure out how <laughs> to do this. And, uh, I mean, maybe by this point they had a few, you know, you had some Cecil B. DeMille, you had some, some other, uh, other films that you could look at to, uh, to see this, but, uh, but really they're just kind of coming up with stuff. They're just throwing it at the lens to see what will happen. Exactly. And, um, and and so 
to me, that makes a lot of what they were able to achieve uh, that much more impressive. Um, and also, it's it's impressive to see how, in a lot of ways, how comparably little we have improved on what they did <laughs> at that time. You know, I mean, they figured out basically how to set up the uh, the two shot, you know, uh, conversation look. They figured out how to how to use different angles for different, you know, emotional effects. They figured out how to do all these things. And these are parts of the language that are still used today and haven't really been, you know, ha haven't really been improved on. Um, you watch something like Metropolis um, from the same period or Dr. Caligari, and you see that uh, they were doing stuff back then that was just, you know, nuts. Yeah. <laughs> it was just <laughs> crazy what they were able to achieve especially with some of the special effects in in uh, metropolis which i argue still stand up today you know i i see movies all the time that don't have nearly the the level of special effects that uh, you know smoothness that uh, metropolis has right no I, i've seen segments of it myself and you know just especially the cityscapes and that yeah. movie they're freaking mind-blowing. <laughs> You're going to tell me that you haven't seen Metropolis, Jose? <laughs> I have not. I will admit Gosh. to you, I have not seen <sighs> Metropolis yet. Yes, I'm sorry. It's out. Hopefully by the time that this uh, this episode airs, I will have, and I, I will have rectified my sin, but as of now, no. Metropolis remains unseen. Well, it's, it is it is a daunting movie. It's it's like over two hours long, <laughs> I think, which, you know, for a silent film is is really epic yeah but um but well worth the time but we're getting a little far afield here oh that's perfectly fine um, yeah one of the things that they do in this uh in in the unknown one of the things that browning does that uh i found really interesting um this this rewatch um is the scene right after uh, cheney decides he's going to get his arms cut off or maybe right after the surgery i don't know mm -hmm. um that today would be what we would call the love montage where, you know, they cut back to Nanon and Malabar uh, falling in love and her getting over her fear and everything. And uh, there's, everybody talks about the old horror movies, the uh, German expressionism. Right. Uh, here, I think we've got a little bit of American impressionism because uh, what they appear to have done is just to put a, a very coarse, cloth over the lens or a thin coarse cloth over the lens uh to the extent that uh it makes the visuals look like they are on a canvas um, yeah. i mean it really looks like a painting like you know kind of a soft focus you know impressionistic i thought painting um of them you know having their you know idealized dream you know love come to fruition and all this kind of thing. Um, and it's really kind of out of place with the rest of the movie. Uh, and it just seems like something that, you know, you know, maybe Browning was behind the camera and just said, Oh, let's just throw this scarf over and see what happens. <laughs> exactly. Or maybe somebody just left it there and they were like, yeah. Oh, well we filmed it. We're going to go with it anyway. Yeah. But I mean, but it's good. And, and some of the, uh, some of the composition in that in those scenes as well i mean seems to me that he's really kind of setting it up as kind of an impressionistic painting i mean if you if you pay attention to uh, where people are in the frame and the, the right. distance from the camera to the actors and things it's it's very painterly at that point so it's it's a neat little thing you know it doesn't really have a lot to do i think with the point of the movie such as it is but uh, it's just a neat thing that it, you know is an experiment and it's nice to see them you know kind of working <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah like you say you know it's you know they uh, to use your words that you used earlier they're basically going by the seat of their pants and they're just trying it's you know it's not a technique it's an experiment you know they're just right. doing anything they can and I, I think it does lend a, a unique atmosphere to those particular scenes because like you say um, usually when you see an effect of that nature, uh, I would associate it more with, say, a hallucination or maybe a dream sequence. And in a way, I guess the love montage is, in a sense, a dream, like an, an idealized dream. You know, this is 
uh, you know, like, the real world is what happens in the circus and all the seedy stuff that happens there, and then the love between Malabar and Anon is kind of like this fantastic thing, and we're seeing it through, it's like we're seeing it through the misty eyes of a lover, so to speak. Exactly. So uh, it's, you it's, have it's, the soul it, of the poet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I try. But, um... Yeah, no, so it, it's uh, it, it I think it is worth mentioning at least, and I, I I know when I first saw it, I I thought it was kind of peculiar, and I wasn't sure exactly what it was. I thought it was just uh, a horrible transfer, to be honest with you. But then I realized that it was a sustained effect, and when uh, I think the second time around, if uh, someone were to watch it like you did, uh, it would have a much more profound effect. I think. Yeah, well, it's it's I don't like I said I don't think it's profound as as much as just kind of intriguing, you know, to see what they were doing. It's it's not something that I think you know. Well, this really speaks to the human condition. But <laughs> no, it's, no. <laughs> it's, it's it's just a neat little thing. Um, so anyway, after that point in the movie, after uh, after he comes back and and discovers that all of his sacrifice and all of his crime or at least the crime that he's committed since he joined the circus. Yeah, <laughs> at least that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, presumably there were some before that, but um, <laughs> but all of this has been for naught, you know, and now here he is literally, you know, disarmed by love. <laughs> <laughs> it's a farewell to arms. Oh, um, God. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do it, you know. Yeah, you it's, it. uh, it's a good one. I, I probably would have done it myself at some point, so thank you for taking the bull by the horns there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but... Uh, but after after that scene, after that uh, extended, you know, gut wrenching scene that we were talking about, it, it kind of the the climax, the nominal climax of the movie, to me seemed almost, you know, beside the point. You know, it was just uh, yeah. it, it was just kind of you know acting out what had already happened, you know, figuratively. But uh, but we do need to talk about it. I think um, <laughs> they. Uh, after they announce their upcoming nuptials and uh, and Alonzo is given a chance to recover from from the shock, um, they want to show him uh, Malabar's new act. You know, apparently they've uh, come up with this great thing that's going to make him the most famous strong man in the circus, where he is uh, standing in the middle of a uh, either the ring or the stage. Um, he's got two horses on either side of him. He's holding on to their bridles with, uh, or, or their harnesses with uh, both hands. Um, they're on treadmills uh, embedded in the stage, and uh, they're running full speed while he holds them there with his tremendous strength. Mm -hmm. um, of course, and I thought this was neat. It gave us kind of a little, you know, behind the scenes, you know, look at the hokum that uh, Browning, who had spent a lot of time in in this environment, would have would have known about. Right. You know, the whole act is dependent on the fact that the horses are on treadmills, right? <laughs> because since they're on treadmills, they can't pull away from him. Uh, I mean, he still has to hold them in place, but uh, but that's much easier than you know two horses actually. <laughs> actually running full speed away from him. And, uh, and Alonzo says, well, you know, what would happen if there was a mechanical fault and the uh, treadmill stopped, you know? <laughs> and uh, Joan Crawford rather nonchalantly says, oh, yeah, well, they would just rip his arms from his body. <laughs> oh, really? You don't yeah, say. <laughs> he would, you, know, you imagine him stroking his chin with his non-existent <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, just pulling a Todd Slaughter, maybe, and rubbing yeah. his hands together. <laughs> it would have been wonderful if he had brought his foot up to his face. <laughs> <laughs> or if he rubbed his feet together. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you see the plan form in his mind. Um, it's a short, uh, it's a short trip from there to the performance where, uh, where you know he's actually in front of the crowd. The horses are going full speed, and Alonzo is able very, you know, embarrassingly easily to get the guy who's responsible for uh, Malabar's safety, <laughs> the guy who's at the lever of the treadmills. He just says, uh, "Hey, why don't you take a break?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll watch this. You, you know, I got this. You, you go take a break. <laughs> and and the guy does. So uh, <laughs> that leaves uh, Malabar completely at Alonzo's mercy. Um, <laughs> he stops the treadmills. Uh, uh, spoilers coming up. <laughs> <laughs> he stops the treadmills. The, uh, the horses start pulling. Malabar is exerting all of his strength. He's getting weaker, trying to keep from being torn to pieces. Um, 
and Joan Crawford runs down to the man she loves to try to distract the horses or something with her lovely gams or whatever. <laughs> um, and of course, because she's in danger because the horses are rearing up and, uh, and kicking their legs around, she's in danger. Uh, Alonzo sees that uh, he's got to do something. He rushes and pushes her out of the way with his body, you know, kind of a body tackle. And the horse comes down and stomps its feet directly onto his chest in a rather, you know, well-filmed, uh, well-edited scene yeah. that really makes it look like he's being crushed by the horse, you know. And, uh, you know, the end, they lived happily ever <laughs> after. <laughs> so. Yeah, which is pretty much how it unfolds. And, yeah, I, um, I, w I wanted to mention what you said uh, preceding your description of the climax here. It, it really is you know, kind of an afterthought, you know, it, it's, it's basically, you know, they're just filming it to kind of make it a complete story. And it's just kind of the formula, again, getting back to, you know, the, the typical melodrama that, you know, good triumphs over evil, which again, Cheney isn't wholly evil, but he does play the part of the villain and the lovers go off into yeah, the mean, sunset. The are, it's, it's a cliche, but the villains are always so much more interesting than the yeah, heroes. Yeah, exactly. That, uh, <laughs> If if it wasn't for them, we'd be screwed, you know. Yeah, yeah, it'd be a boring story. <laughs> but, yeah. But um, yeah, it, it's it's interesting that you said that because, you know, we basically, especially after it comes after, you know, the the gut wrencher, as I guess we'll kind of call it now. Um, when uh, Alonzo sees Nanon and Malabar together, you know, it's like, that's it. You know that that is the high emotional peak of the movie and then the climax is crazy and wacky and yeah. mad as I mean, it is it's it's really it's really wild and, yeah. and i admit that uh, and again you know giving credit to uh uh to browning with this i thought it was extremely well filmed and extremely well edited such that uh, the first time i saw it i remember i was really kind of on the edge of my seat yeah um you know just watching to see you know what was going to happen with you know i didn't know i mean I didn't know if Browning would have the guy actually torn to pieces. You know, I didn't know if uh, I didn't know how it was going to play out. Uh, there, there was lots of great cuts between the horses running on the treadmill back to Malabar, back to Joan, back to uh, Cheney. You know, all yeah. and it just really orchestrated so well that it really visually kept you um, just right there with it. And uh, and that was just good directing on uh, Browning's part, in my opinion. No, for sure. It, it was funny because when I was watching it um, on my laptop, I the DVD you know time counter was on, and I saw how much time was left in the movie, and it was getting closer and closer to the climax. I'm like, how the? Because I I basically knew how it ended more or less, right. and I'm sitting here thinking, how in the hell are they going to be able to get this all done and finished within the short amount of time? And like you say, it's, you know, just that fast paced editing and the direction that, you know, Browning employs that it's just, you know, bam, bam, bam. It goes from one shot to the next and it, you're just trying to keep up with it all that, you know, it's one of the most uh, <laughs> adrenaline fueled scenes in a silent movie that I've ever seen. Yeah, it's just it's just crazy the pace it goes. I mean, not even the ending. I mean, you you compare it to the ending of Phantom of the Opera, and that seems really slow in comparison. Even yeah. though that's a chase scene, and you you go to the you know the climax and the unknown, and it it goes by crazy fast. And there's so much energy going on in there that it, it, you can't help but become completely you know soaked into the proceedings, so to speak. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is. Um... I mean, this is a great. Uh, I would recommend anybody to uh, to watch this movie if they've if they haven't seen a lot of uh, silent films. If they like, you know, crazy movies like the like the type that I'm always on about, <laughs> um, this is a really good one to go see because for one thing, it's got all the crazy plot twists and uh, insane, you know, aspects to uh, to the story that that you know and love, you know. Um, and also, it's a very short film. I mean, on the uh, yeah. on the I watched it on the Turner Classic Movies uh, DVD set of uh, some of Cheney's movies that came out a few years ago, which is an excellent, excellent thing. Anybody who's interested in Cheney at all should own that uh, DVD set. Um, and it's only like what forty nine minutes long, forty yep. something. I think there's a slightly longer cut somewhere, but this is the 
the one that they had. Um, and it's just, you know, you can watch, you can knock it out in a couple of, uh, you know, just an hour. Yeah, pretty much. Almost. Yeah. Even lunch break at work, you could watch an entire Lon Chaney movie and be all the better for it. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. I mean, and you, and you definitely will be all the better for it if if you take the time out of your day to watch The Unknown because, like we mentioned before, it, it, it kind of seems to kind of get swept under the rug compared to some of his other movies, especially with horror fans because, again, uh, usually the uh, the majority of fans know Cheney from Phantom and Hunchback, so it, they'd be doing themselves a great service if they took the time to watch The Unknown, because it is a really cool little flick, uh, to kind of put it <laughs> in, a, in a simple way. But um, I, I wanted to kind of touch upon uh, something else. It's a little bit more on a deeper level. Uh, than some of the things we previously discussed about, but uh, this is this is a point that seems to come up a lot in discussion of the unknown, and basically what it is is that the the whole Alonzo the Armless competing with Malabar, who is the circus strongman, it kind of seems to play on some castration imagery, like Alonzo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, it's it's kind of a funny feeling. Yeah, it's it's they play it kind of subtly, but um, no, yeah, the, a lot of a lot of people have definitely made that uh, you know that illusion that Alonzo is obviously lacking in something strength to you know to give it a a, a name, and he uh, you know he basically goes through this ritual where he literally does lose a part of himself. And then he's none the better for it. So, um, you know, I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, how uh, basically what you think of the whole castration, uh, you know, theme within the movie. I'm for it. <laughs> You're for <laughs> castration. <laughs> so, um, I think that there's something to that. Um, Freudian imagery in, in film is something that uh, that has been there, obviously, since... Freud, um, and whatever people think these days about, you know, the truth or uh, half truth or complete falsity of, of uh, Freud's theories, um, it's it it is there in the movies. I mean, people were using that. You know, this was this stuff did not happen by accident. <laughs> and, um, and and I think that there's uh, that there's something to that in this case, especially uh, because you think about the uh, the the man. What makes what makes the stereotypical man is his strength and his virility, his you know um, his muscles, his yeah. you know toughness. And Malabar's got all that, you know. And uh, a man without arms is a man who can't pick things up. A man who can't. Uh, you know, work in the fields, a man who can't, you know, enfold his loved one in his arms, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, Alonzo is, at the beginning of the movie, less than a man, I would say. And, you know, if you're less than a man, you know, then then that's that has sexual connotations as well. Um, however, you know, it's, it's kind of sly, you know, if you think about it in that way, because not only is uh, Alonzo actually... Uh, does he actually have arms and thus is a man, you know, he's a full man. Yeah. Um, he's actually a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a little he actually, bit more. Yeah. He has two thumbs, you know, and uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got more than just the one little stubby. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And all and, the uh, things that he can do with it. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, it would be, there are the, it would have a thousand and one uses, or <laughs> one really, but I mean, still, it's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, the things you can do with your two thumbs. <laughs> right. So, uh, so yeah, he's, he's kind of hiding that. He's hiding that uh, part of himself. Um, but it's the, uh, oh, oh, this is, this actually ties in beautifully because, um, you know, this is completely off the cuff for me, but he's, if, uh, you know, if we go back to talking about the, villains in the horror movies as the nerds, you know, the outcast, you know, um, what is it that, uh, that the girls in, in junior high school say they want? They want someone who's sensitive, someone who 
has a good you know personality someone who uh, who likes poetry and and <laughs> sappy songs you know but and and that's what the nerds try to be for them um but what do they really want? They want the strong man, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when they and when they get him, you know, then the nerds are 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 broken hearted. But um, so and that's what happens to uh, to Cheney or to uh, to Alonzo here is that he's uh, he's you know saying, well, what she wants is a man who doesn't have this, you know. Could you say that maybe he's thinking, she, or maybe you could draw a line from not wanting the hands all over her, not wanting to be embraced, to wanting a sexless relationship? You know? Yeah. I mean, it seems it seems a short jump. You know, it seems a, a one might follow the other. You know, um, and and Alonzo is willing to do that, and not only to do that, you know, uh, temporarily, but to do it permanently. Um, and, and in response, in return for that, he's, he's, you know, crushed by a horse. So let that be a listen to you kids. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Don't go try impressing the person you love or you will be crushed by a farm animal. Have fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we kind of, you know, get towards the end of our lovely podcast here, um, I basically kind of asked the guests to capsulize everything that we've discussed within the episode kind of in a neat bow by asking them and thus you why did you choose this film the unknown to spotlight for sinister spotlight uh well uh, i had a couple of reasons for it uh one was just that i'm a uh you know the the kind of stuff that we focus on the uh on the blog uh, at Mad 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 Movies is um, usually stuff from the 70s, stuff from the early 80s, maybe late 60s, which was no doubt uh, one of the maddest eras of cinema. For sure. Um, things were just going nuts, going crazy at that time. Um, but uh, I, as, as readers of my blog know, I cut my teeth on the, uh, on the universal horrors. The Wolfman is, is the movie that made me love horror movies. Um, and from that era and before that, there are so many great, uh, movies that people just don't, uh, I mean, sadly, it seems a lot of young people who are just getting into the horror genre don't go back and learn that kind of history anymore. You know, I sound like a, like a crotchety old man, but it's true. You know, you, I, I run into people all the time. Oh, you know, anything before Texas Chainsaw Massacre is just, you know, ancient history that they don't even care about, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Which is sad. It really is. And, and especially when you go back and find something like this. And the reason I picked the unknown, um, is because, you know, the unknown plot wise, you know, exploitation wise, filming wise is just as crazy and off the rails as, uh, you know, a majority of the seventies movies that we talk about on the blog. And, right. and it's, uh, it's just as much fun. It's just as, uh, energetic, just as, you know, joyful in its twisted way. <laughs> and, um, and I think it's a movie that, uh, that really shows, you know, that the mad, crazy, you know, energy of movies didn't start in the seventies. You know, it started almost at the beginning of the, of the medium. And, uh, so that's, that's why I picked it also because I, uh, you know, I love Lon Chaney. I love the movie. Um, and uh, and it's just one of my favorite uh, silent films that nobody knows about, you know. So I wanted to bring that to a uh, to a wider audience of you know the what did you say the two people who are listening to the podcast? Yeah, about two people. <laughs> one of them is one of them's my mom. So at least uh, at least she'll know. Well, tell her to, tell her to watch it with you next time. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. We'll we'll have a we'll have a nice uh, evening with Alonzo the Armless for sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> But uh, no, that's, you know, you, you bring up excellent points in your summation there. You know, not to, you know, horror fans, you know, just in general should really take the time to definitely discover the roots of the genre that they love so much. And you really can't do too much better than finding a film like The Unknown. It's, you know, it's like you say, it's a, it's a mad, mad movie and it's, you know, it's just a ton of fun to watch it. And again, you can watch it within a matter of an hour. 
won't even take you that long and you'll have a ton of fun doing it. So, you know, it comes with the highest recommendations from both the vicar and myself. So, uh, basically, that brings it our little episode to an end. I thank you again, Vicar, for joining us. It's been a definite pleasure having you and just discussing uh, geeky film stuff in general with you. <laughs> oh, it's been a lot of fun for me, too, and I really I really appreciate the invitation. Oh, but, yeah, of course, and for those of you listening, if you're not followers already, please, by all means, begin following Mad, 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 Mad Movies, uh, your <laughs> four M's and then the word movies. Yeah, blogspot.com. And it is delicious. It's mmm movies. <laughs> <laughs> And it, it, seriously, it is a ton of fun. I can't get enough just reading the stuff that the Vicar and the Duke produce, and I'm sure you will too, again, if you haven't uh, stumbled upon it yet. Definitely take the time to get to that blog immediately after you watch The Unknown to see some of the more films that the Duke and Vicar like to watch in their spare time. So again, Vicar, thank you so much for discussing The Unknown with us today, and thank you all for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope all of you have an awesome night. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>